Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome APTA Chair David Stackrow, moderator of this morning's Safety and Security Excellence Awards. Good morning. As many of you have heard, on Saturday we lost a bus operator, Thomas Dunn, from Hart in Tampa after a tragic incident on board one of their buses. This devastating act is a reminder of the crucial service our frontline employees provide to communities across the nation. Please join me in a moment of silence as we offer our thoughts and prayers to Thomas's family and friends, as well as to his colleagues from Hart. Thank you. Each year, we gather to honor the people and organizations that demonstrate excellence in safety and security, keeping our riders and employees, our communities and neighbors safe is more than an operating principle or a strategic goal. It's a core value. It's who we are. And it's the most important thing we do every day. It's a privilege to recognize today's award recipients for their achievements in developing and sustaining strong safety cultures and rigorous security programs. I'd like to begin by thanking the members of this year's selection committee, and I'd ask that you please hold your applause until I've announced all four names. Lou Brown of Jacobs Engineering, Ron Pavlik of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Jerry Ruggiero, also of Jacobs Engineering, and Lisa Stays of the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Please join me in thanking these safety and security professionals. So let's begin with our Certificate of Merit winners. For bus systems with more than 20 million passenger trips annually, the Certificate of Merit for Safety is awarded to Niagara Frontier Transportation Authority in Buffalo, New York. The Niagara Frontier Transportation Authority adopted a hands-on, multimodal approach to reducing employee injuries. The agency has reduced recordable, recordable employee injuries by 33% and has improved overall employee safety throughout the system. Congratulations to NFTA. And now for security in this category. The Certificate of Merit for Security is awarded to Pace Suburban Bus in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Pace Suburban Bus implemented the Security Enhancement Through Assessment Program to increase security awareness among operators and employees. PACE employees and TSA inspectors place unattended bags on random buses to boost operator and passenger responsiveness. As a result, operators gained a heightened awareness of their surroundings and completed more thorough pre-trip inspections. Let's congratulate PACE Suburban Bus for its innovative security awareness program. It's now time to announce this year's gold awards. We have a total of six winners. First, for systems with fewer than four million passengers, passenger trips annually, the gold award for safety goes to Rock Island County Metropolitan Mass Transit District in Moline, Illinois. Rock Island, Rock Island County Metropolitan Mass Transit District created a safety program that reduced preventable collisions by 100,000 miles in, per 100,000 miles by 46 percent, and that was with an almost 7 percent increase in miles driven. Let's hear how Metrolink made this possible.
Metrolink is proud to serve the Illinois Quad Cities and surrounding communities. With a 60 bus fleet and even three passenger ferry boats, we provide about 3.3 million trips each year and do so with our highest priority placed on safety. Our safety culture is one that has been developed over the course of many years. Achievements in safety could not have been attained without our tremendous team of operators, mechanics, and administrative staff. Working together over the past three years, we have reduced our preventable accidents by nearly one half. We believe this has been attributed primarily to the improvements we have made to our comprehensive training program. In addition to the 120-day training period for new recruits, our veteran workforce spends approximately 30 days mentoring the next generation of operators. Post-collision training is customized to address incidents, and all operators are provided with an eight-hour refresher course each year. Here at Metrolink, we know it is our people that make our award-winning safety program so successful. Monthly shop talks are held with our maintenance technicians and offer an open forum for improving our safety standards. We are constantly investing in new technologies such as collision avoidance systems and improved video surveillance. We love our community, our employees, and our riders. And we are thrilled to share with them this AFTA 2019 Safety and Security Gold Award for Bus Safety Excellence. Congratulations. Congratulations. And one more time, let's congratulate Rock Island County Metropolitan Mass Transit District. The next gold award is for systems with more than 4 million and fewer than 20 million bus passenger trips annually. The gold award goes to Omnitrans in San Bernardino, California. A strong safety culture is Omnitrans' number one priority. Omnitrans has created several programs that show its commitment to safety across the system. Let's listen to how the new coach operator training program contributed to an award-winning culture. Let's congratulate Omnitrans, and I'd like to ask the winners to remain on stage, please. 
Now on to security in this category. The gold award for security also goes to Omnitrans. As we saw in its video, Omnitrans created an innovative emergency communication system that allows the agency to be in continuous connectivity with first responders during an emergency. Congratulations. Our next two gold awards are both in the category of systems with 20 million or more bus passenger trips annually. The gold award for safety goes to Capital Metropolitan Transportation Authority in Austin, Texas. <laughs> Capital Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or Cap Metro, partnered with the Texas Transportation Institute to identify the root causes for an increase in accidents. The Institute and the agency developed countermeasures to reverse the trend, and this allowed CAP Metro to assess its safety culture and establish a baseline. Let's listen to how this partnership created a safer work environment. At Capital Metro, our mission is to safely operate a dynamic transportation system. Over the last 30 years, we have seen phenomenal growth in our region, but we also started seeing an uptick in our crash numbers. Initially, we thought there's more traffic, more construction, and more distracted drivers, but we wanted to know the cause. So, we asked our friends at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute to study our crashes and help us develop strategies to reduce them. One solution was launching an ad campaign on the back of buses using clever messages and imagery that cut rear-end collisions with buses by 69%. We implemented a new employee reporting system to supplement the onboard reporting system that collects data on hazard potential hazards, and near misses. We worked with local television stations to create public service announcements that focused on behaviors leading to crashes, like turning right in front of a bus. We had our first ever Rail Safety Week to emphasize the importance of being safe around tracks. We also improved our signage at stations, stops, and on vehicles across the system. At Capital Metro, safety is a core value. It's a part of our DNA. Congratulations. Congratulations, Randy. Congratulations. Now for our last gold award in this category. The Gold Award for Security and Emergency Response goes to the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> Greater Cleveland RTA recognized the potential for an active shooter and decided to be proactive. They partnered with the TSA to conduct a full-scale active shooter exercise. Let's listen to how the agency implemented the exercise and enhanced its security program. There's only one way to employ over 2,300 people to reliably deliver over 40 million passengers across 457 square miles annually by making safety our number one priority. We're the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, the largest transit authority in Ohio. Our Transit Police Department worked with a number of internal and external agencies to complete a full-scale active shooter drill. This exercise had a clear focus with specific goals that enabled RTA employees to make confident and competent decisions during an active shooter incident. RTA's Transit Police followed up this exercise with training RTA staff because active shooter incidents can occur at any time in any environment and with little warning.
more than 94% of all employees across all districts completed the training. RTA and Transit Police are proud to keep the greater Cleveland community safe every day. We're honored to accept the 2019 AFTA Gold Award for Bus Security. Congratulations. Our final gold award is in the category of private companies that provide contracted transportation management services to public transportation systems. The gold award for safety goes to TransDev in service to the Regional Transit Authority in New Orleans, Louisiana. When TransDev discovered an increase in the number of bus collisions, it immediately created additional safety and security positions. In addition, TransDev enforced an accident reduction plan. As a result, preventable and non-preventable collisions have declined, and so have claim costs. Let's hear how TransDev made this happen. Safety is TransDev's number one priority. Our 745 employees in service to the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority take pride in reliably delivering nearly 19 million passengers annually. The RTA is the largest public transit agency in Louisiana, and since 2017, we've cut the cost of claims paid by 65%, from 6.2 million to 2.1 million, and lowered the total accident rate by 20%, from 270 to 216. How did we do it? As a team. Executive leadership analyzed data and tasked the safety department with reducing accidents. The plan was simple. Two safety supervisors would be solely dedicated to conducting 100% of the onboard driver evaluations and trail checks for all 268 fixed route operators. This gave safety supervisors the ability to reinforce good behavior, retrain when bad behaviors were observed, and pull operators for more formalized training as needed. TransDev also incorporated the FDA's SMS principles to identify hazards and streamline reporting and mitigations, allowing operators to relay concerns in real time during driver evaluation. So to the team who helped make this happen, thank you. This recognition reflects TransDev's commitment to reducing accidents and keeping New Orleans safe. Congratulations. 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 Let's give all of our Certificate of Merit winners and Gold Awards winners another big round of applause for their accomplishments. One of the most valuable aspects of any APTA event is learning from an open discussion among experts and thought leaders. This morning, we're going to hear a lively, informative conversation on the issue of managing the curb how public transit agencies and others are managing the crowded corridor. We're honored to have with us an accomplished, nationally recognized urban planner who will moderate our panel discussion. David Dixon is Vice President for Planning and Urban Design Leader with Urban Places, a real estate development consultancy that promotes sustainable, mixed-use neighborhoods. He has led planning in post-Katrina New Orleans, converted strip malls into suburban downtowns, and re-examined the role of density in building more livable, resilient, and equitable communities. His current work focuses on urban transformations, 
These include developing a long depressed neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio into a new arts and innovation district, planning for a nine million square foot mixed use neighborhood next to downtown Tampa, and turning a public housing site into a market driven mixed income neighborhood in one of Boston's most historic areas. David's work has been honored by numerous urban planning and design associations, and he is the recipient of the American Institute of Architects Thomas Jefferson Medal for a lifetime of creating livable neighborhoods, vibrant civic spaces, and, downtown, and vital downtowns. Please join me in welcoming David Dixon. Thank you, David, very much. And it's uh, good morning. It's great to see all of you. I will point out that if you want to do a lot of things in life, just get old. It, it, it works. Um, so uh, one thing that really struck me as I thought about the cities that my colleagues who I'll introduce on this, uh, my, my, my fellow panelists who I'll introduce in a few minutes, as I thought about the cities they represent, as I thought about the cities uh, that received awards, and I want to say that one of the things that to me is very heartening is uh, just to see how committed APTA is to innovation and to providing resources to all of you, something that I think is going to matter much more in the rapidly changing world that in, in whose midst we are and, and uh, uh, in a world that where change is, is accelerating. Um, but I want to say, as I thought about each of these cities, I realized how dramatically they're changing. Some are growing rapidly in population. Others, like Cleveland, may not be growing in population, but the nature of that population is changing dramatically. And that's what we're going to talk about today as a start to sort of set the stage for managing the curb. And I realize I... So I'm going to set the stage by t talking about how much the, not how much the world has changed, but how much it's going to change. Uh, and uh, when I was asked to do this by Rich Weaver, who is your wonderful and always very cheerful and enthusiastic executive director, who I think is just terrific, um, I uh, realized that I have spent my entire career advocating for curbside parking. It's, it's just uh, uh, who, who would question the value of curbside parking for almost any street? And I realized that my, my urban mobility consultants, which is what we call our, our fellow uh, colleagues in our, in our urban places group, uh, no longer do. I, I was lectured by one of my colleagues who pointed out that they're doing a project for Google in Toronto where they can basically, uh, by replacing uh, parked cars with drop-off, increase throughput by about 30 times in terms of the number of people who have access to that curb. And that really got me thinking about what we, as we enter a new, a new era in which so much is changing, how does, the, how does the way in which we manage the curb need to change? Because uh, we probably haven't really need to think about this since uh, the advent of universal auto ownership after World War II, but we are entering a period that is just as transformational. And, it starts with how are we changing as, as a society, as, uh, in, our, in our various, in our, in our cities, in our communities. And the first point I want to make is that we are entering a period, we are not at peak city, we are at the cusp of a period of urban opportunity that we have not seen in my considerably long lifetime. Uh, essentially, it's driven by demographics. So uh, right now, about 60 plus percent of US housing supply is single family, uh, uh, suburban housing, single, detached single family houses in the suburbs. If you knock, if you tap people on the shoulder and say, what kind of house would you like to live in? The only group that on net says they would prefer single family detached houses in the suburbs are households with children and two adults. And sadly, an awful lot of households with children, well, maybe not sadly, but are one adult. And they actually prefer urban housing. They will be about 15% of all households by the mid-2020s. Basically, our housing supply is way out of whack with who we are as a society. And going forward for the next 20 years, more than 80% of all net new households will be singles and couples, and guess where they like to live, 
and more than half will be folks like some of us who are over 65, and basically we don't like taking very big houses in the suburbs. So uh, the nature of our population is re relentlessly pro-urban for at least two decades. Uh, this is one reason why urban housing values have been rising so much faster than suburban, probably at three times the, the pace of suburban values, and why cities that aren't gaining population, I'm working right now in Dayton and Memphis and Birmingham, have tremendous urban opportunity. But it is not just the opportunity that we need to think about. Uh, th let me just finish that by saying, we will not be able to meet the demand for urban housing. Think of all those wonderful new two bedroom, one and two bedroom apartments appearing in all your cities. We won't be able to meet that demand for the next 20 years. Um, <clears throat> Uh, hence the, the opportunity our cities have. But there is an imperative uh, around urban development, uh, urban revitalization, around, around uh, making our cities amenable and walkable and as cool and livable as can be, that's just as compelling as the opportunity. Because in 2040, the US will add fewer net new workers than we did in 2010. This, of course, relates to an aging population. Uh, that means that uh, at the same time, uh, roughly 90% of all net new jobs, frankly, require some form of college or higher education, two, four more years. Uh, this means that our labor supply is as out of whack with demand as our housing supply. Uh, basically, uh, by 2030, uh, technology, media, telecommunications, our, 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 our knowledge, this is a portion of our knowledge economy, uh, but just these three industries will <clears throat> basically uh, be looking for four million plus more workers than they can find. Uh, this, our labor shortage is already costing our economy about three to five percent of GDP. So this is, this is a serious. But now let's bring this home to Cleveland, to Austin, to New Orleans, to the cities we've been hearing about. These are cities who basically uh, Think, if they think for about a second and a half, realize that economic growth comes from knowledge industries. Knowledge industries have as their natural resource educated workforce, the, the workforce that is in particularly short supply. Where do these workers want to live? Resoundingly in cities. The more educated you are, the more affluent, I know this sounds terribly elitist, and I'm going to come to that in a minute, but it's true, the more you want to live in cool, walkable, mixed-use, lively, urban areas. Every city I know uh, <clears throat> feels a great deal of pressure to be as, as walkable, and let me just say, I'm sorry, as connected to have as the best public transit, how dare I leave that out, uh, as possible uh, to, as, as a fundamental amenity uh, so that basically they can offer people a lifestyle free of cars, full of great brew pubs and lofts and, and walkable access to jobs. Uh, <clears throat> and that means they need to take advantage of this housing opportunity to really fuel as much urban growth as they can. So what else is happening that is reinforcing this? Well, how many of you are, ever wonder about aut autonomous mobility? You, somebody has to raise a hand. If you don't, then we need to have a different talk. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, my dear company, Stantec, has a very highly developed autonomous mobility uh, program, which I find now is part of virtually every project we do. Uh, and we all know that at some point in the, 1930, in the 2030s, a majority of vehicles in the US will be self-driving, and that will become a norm. And I would predict in urban areas, mobility on demand, not just the Lyft and Uber we know today, will be the rule private auto uh, owned auto ship, owned vehicle, owned mobility will, will be something that is much more likely in the suburbs because in urban areas you'll have on-demand service. But, but before then, by the mid to late 2020s, more than half the vehicles on the U.S. will be self-parking. Uh, this means, I mean, so, uh, we'll have enough connected technology in them to park themselves. This means that when you drive up to a destination, arrive at a destination, you won't park your car. You will, if you'll excuse me, putting it this way, you'll say to your car, go park yourself. And our cars will park themselves much more compactly than we do, which means that uh, by the, in less than a decade or less, 
we are going to start having lots of empty parking spaces in parking garages. These parking garages are really hard to convert to anything else. What this means is we're going to be able to support, think of an era of tremendous demand for urban development, of a real imperative to develop our cores as much as we can, and now an era where we don't have to pay for parking when we build new housing or new office or new anything because we're beginning to have a lot of empty uh, parking spaces. Um, <clears throat> this is an era that's less, that's at most a decade away, less than that. And now think how long any of the projects take that we're planning today. We need to be planning today for that era. By the mid-2030s, I sort of gave this away, we will be an era in the era of autonomous mobility and autonomous transit and autonomous buses, um, which means, of course, that people will not park at a destination. So we are at peak parking today, which means a major cost of urban development is about to uh, begin to fade away. Uh, to uh, we not overemphasize this point, Today, or in 2010, if you built a million square feet of mixed-use development in most cities, you need more than a million square feet of parking. Let's fast forward to the mid-2030s. Uh, <clears throat> that same garage we built today will support roughly three million square feet of urban development, not one million. I say this to begin to think of the opportunities to densify and intensify our already booming cities and what are the implications for how we manage our transit systems and, and particularly how we manage access to the curb because it is the curb that is the exchange point for most of us, for many of us, between mobility and the activity that we seek. But I wanna finish on a point that is very troubling and there is no easy solution. All the things I'm talking about are making urban cores a lot more expensive. The number of people living in poverty in suburbs has increased by more than 50% since 2000 in all of our major metros. Almost all of them, certainly across the board, has increased more than 50%. Uh, <clears throat> We have an economy, uh, thanks to our knowledge industries, that basically sends most of the economic rewards to the top 20%, particularly the top 10%, even more the top five, and most of all the top 1%. Most of us have not, don't earn anything more today in real dollar terms, 80% of us, than we did in 1970. Um, think now, cities growing much more expensive, most of us, not plugged into an economy that is delivering substantial gains, certainly anything on par with the increased cost of urban living, we have a huge built-in uh, equity crisis in our urban cores that is going to grow steadily worse over the next 20 years. And I can't think of anybody more on the front lines of helping all of us deal with that, giving us all the access we need than you folks out here. And I'm proud to be able to talk to you in this regard. And finally, I want to say one of the first recognitions of all the opportunity that we have uh, in, on the curb is parking day, which if you're a planner like me, you think is just about the coolest thing to come along in a long time, and that came from many of you folks. So thank you very much. On this note, I would like to invite my fellow panelists to come up and talk about how to manage the curb in this changing world. And I will invite them up as I introduce them. And I will first introduce uh, Jim, no, I'm sorry, um, Andrew Johnson, Secretary of APTA's Midsize Operations Committee and CEO in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a city that is undergoing all kinds of fascinating changes and kind of a, a, a poster child for how a mid-sized city can succeed in our current economy and world. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Catherine Prince, Mobility Project Manager of <coughs> Transportation for the Transportation Mobility Department in the city of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a city that is actually growing. Uh, Jim McAteer, President and Owner of Transit Insight in Nashville, Tennessee, another city undergoing dramatic changes. I'm going to have to stop repeating that. Uh, and uh, Jeffrey Paniati. Executive Director and CEO of the Institute of Transportation Engineers in Washington, the group that tells us what standards we have to meet. So thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be able to moderate a terrific panel like this. So let's give them a hand. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
to the audience, if you have questions during our discussion, this is, well, clearly it's not a lecture there. We, we, none of us could coordinate that well. Uh, but please, if you have questions, raise your hand. There are mic, go to one of the mics, and at an appropriate time, I'll stop the panel and go ahead and ask your question. We will have quite, hold about the last 15 minutes for questions in, in any event. But I want to start the questions, and I think I basically will go in this order, uh, order in which you've sat down, by saying in, in a period in which times are changing, uh, our pe people are changing, our economy is changing, how do you see the, these rapid social, demographic, and economic changes impacting our streets and how we use our curbs? And I'll start with you, sir. Sure. David, I think you did a great job in some of the demographic information that you showed. And you know, really, when I think about what people want today, right? they want that mobility on demand. They want the choices. And they want to make those choices you know, on an as-I'm-going basis. And I think about my own children, who are in their um, early to mid-20s. When they make a trip, they're thinking about how to get there. They're not thinking about how they're getting back. They're not, think they're not worrying about it at that point in time. And I, I don't know that I can think of a trip I've made in my life where I'm not thinking about how I'm getting there and how I'm getting home. But when they go, they figure, when I get there, I'll figure out, and when I'm ready to go home, I'll figure out how I'm going to get there. And it might be by, if they're going downtown DC, it might be by metro. It might be you know, getting a ride with someone else. It might be taking a Uber or a Lyft home. But it's not I'm going to plan in advance. I want to make my choice when I want to make it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is reflective of the kind of demographics that you were showing. Thank you. And I suspect they also don't want to add 20 minutes to go park a car and then go where they're going. No. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jim. Well, I think that um, it's an opportunity for cities to reclaim some of the space that um, you know, automobiles have slowly eroded into the sidewalk space, into the living space that is the street. And I think that TransAge is going to kind of take the lead on helping cities um, reclaim that in that they can use the data that they collect um, from the Ubers and Lyfts if they can work with them on that, but also from the scooter companies that are starting to spill over you know, onto that space in an unmanaged way. And I think that we need to be thinking about that. So. We're doing a downtown plan for Memphis. One of my colleagues didn't tell me what he was doing, but we, wa as we were walking around for an hour. He counted two people on bikes and 68 people on scooters, and they had been dropped actually one month before, many of them with briefcases. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, you did talk about how we are changing as a society, moving towards on-demand mobility. So in the city of Fort Lauderdale, we are going through the same challenges, and more so because we have a transient population with uh, a lot of um, snowbirds coming in, and we have our Generation Z uh, spring breakers. So the general trend is, uh, to everyone's point, we do not have all the many cars driving anymore. The car ownership has fallen down. Um, the hotels who, who were dependent on folks driving from the airport no longer need those spaces. So we see a huge decrease in our garage parking demand up to 30 to 50%. So um, when there's a demand this, or lack of demand for parking, how do we uh, reprioritize our curve for people rather than cars. So the city has been moving in the direction of uh, putting bike lanes, um, designated parking for our scooters and our bikes, um, and creating rideshare zones um, because that's where our uh, most of the activity is. People want to be dropped off and not think about where to park and how do we get back. Um, so that's where we are moving as a city. Mm -hmm. and. Um, more so lately, we're talking about flexible streets. You mentioned autonomous vehicles, uh, the need for a vertical curb separating people from moving cars uh, as we move in the future might not be necessary at all uh, because the, uh, the safety for the vehicles, uh, it's going to be much higher with autonomous vehicles. So how do we make streets flexible to hold activities just farmers market and art fairs, maybe in the daytime it is where it's throughput, in the nighttime it is something else. So we are going in the direction of flexible streets. Thank you. So actually both you and Jim have, have said we need to accommodate many more type, many more mobility modes in the same right of way. And 
that curb lane is certainly a, a key piece of this. It's not just about drop off, it's about literally how to use that lane. And then you have pointed out that uh, we also have a much greater variety of activities and that we really want to accommodate with, with folks. And so, thank you. And yes. I think being from uh, Michigan, we're sending you a lot of those snowbirds and uh, <laughs> spring breakers. So, um, but back in Grand Rapids, uh, the, the thing that, that strikes me is really just that intense competition for, uh, for those streets, which really wind up being a lot narrower than you think they are. Um, we, we see a lot of disruption in, in transportation right now, be it you know, bikes, scooters, uh, things like that. And we have to balance uh, how we're utilizing uh, the streets so we don't wind up in an us versus them type situation. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have a number of people thinking in kind of that analog way, you know, this is, streets are for parking and driving and, and you know, worry about the sidewalk for anything else you want to do and it's not that way anymore. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do we balance those, those interests and find that happy medium where everyone can coexist? Mm -hmm. And it, it right now is a bit of a unicorn. Thank you. Um, I have a, a, I'm going to insert a question here. Could each of you tell me who in your community uh, has control over the curb. Who can make the decision about how the curb is used and how, how do you input into that decision process? So, a little bit different, right? Yeah, of course, I'm not yeah. a, a yeah. transit yeah. operator. I you come can tell us about the world then. Yeah, okay. so I, I come representing um, my members who um, are typically transportation planners, uh, mm -hmm. transportation engineers in a, a whole variety of settings and I think you know they are wrestling with finding that balance. The point that was just made when they, you know, traditionally, if you come at it from a civil engineering standpoint, right, you're thinking about that curb for two things: catching water, and, and moving water, and parking cars. That that's traditionally probably how you thought about the curb, and now you you, you have to deal with all the demands that folks have talked, and some more, right? Not you know turning them into parklets and all, all the various things. And you're trying to deal with business owners who feel like they have the first right to what happens on that curb versus the community needs for that curb. And I think that's what they're trying to, to work with right now is think about how do you deal with that in an environment where the business owner might want one thing. They might want parking. They might want freight delivery for their goods and services. And the community wants something different. The community wants access in a variety, to a variety of things, the scooter, the bike share, the TNC, the traditional transit, and many more things. And I think that's where, where they are right now, is trying to figure out how to balance, which is why I mm -hmm. like that word, those competing, often competing demands mm -hmm. in a way that gets to a, mm -hmm. the right solution. You're reminding me, my colleague pointed out that the work we were doing in Toronto suggested that you had so much more, this term sounds so typical, throughput, meaning so many more people who could shop, grab coffee, use those businesses if you do not use those spaces for parking. But, but it's a, convincing, I understand. I think is the yeah. challenge, right? I agree with you and, yeah. and I think you know, it's, it's the convincing <laughs> that's the hard part. So how many of you feel you're in the communications business? You don't have to answer. Okay, thank you. All right, Jim, how do you, who makes the decision? Well, how do you input into it? Yeah, Nashville is a unique um, city. I don't, well, in some ways, but the uh, obviously Your the agency. public works uh, department is the one that handles the ultimate decisions on that. Highly influenced by developers and the planning department, you know, they they try to work together well. One thing that um, there is a nonprofit organization that, in terms of advocating for the user of those areas. Um, called Walk Bike Nashville, which has been super successful in working with WeGo, which is the transit agency in Nashville, um, and the mayor's office by sort of pushing Public Works and the city to do more, to be better about advocating for pedestrians and cyclists and these and scooters and everything else. And they do that through um, report cards, mm -hmm. um, through safety audits, and so they go. They they act as a messaging unit, kind of to the community, and then also directly work directly with Public Works. So it's a fine line of. You know, Public Works kind of gets a little upset, you know, on occasion with some of the things that, that Walk Bike is doing um, in coordination with WeGo. But uh, it's, been, it's been highly successful, and I recommend other communities think about doing something Thank like you. that. So you helped me refine the question. Catherine, how do you make a difference? 
Um, I'll talk about a project we installed last year. It was a demonstration project it, um, on Las Solas Boulevard, which is the heart of our city. Uh, it has day and nighttime life, uh, restaurants, offices, uh, bars. And um, there's a section of the roadway which had two eastbound, two westbound lanes. And uh, we said, let's read think this corridor and we repurpose the outside lane uh, for uh, bikes. So we have a parking protected bike lane and we repurpose some of the on-street parking spaces uh, for rideshare zones and loading zones. So what that did for throughput, you mentioned throughput, vehicles were actually moving faster, faster in the sense within speed limit, but they were consistently moving. There was no stop and grow uh, traffic. We increased safety to any percent decrease in traffic crashes, and uh, you mentioned foot traffic. So there was a 40% increase in foot traffic just by uh, giving more space to people biking and those mm -hmm. opportunities for ride share drop-offs and designated spaces for loading, it took some pressure of the main street uh, for curb access, just overall increase in safety and, uh, and sales for the neighbors. Mm -hmm. So who owns the curb space? It's an interesting question. Cities, counties do, but there's a sense of ownership by the adjacent property owner or the building owner mm -hmm. uh, or the homeowner. So when we install these ride share zones, um, these were during the peak hours, the weekend time and evening time, that's when most people are out on the street for businesses. So there is this friction between the owners and we had to convince them, let's try it out for three months. If it doesn't work, we'll go back and we identified these spaces uh, working with our partners in Uber and Lyft and Yellow Cab. So they were hot spots of pick up and drop off. So there's this constant negotiation. After three months, they understood the overall impact and the overall uptick in foot traffic and sales. So we were able to get there, but this is always constant negotiation and discussion with our partners is necessary. Thank you. Uh, the Rapid uh, serves six different cities uh, in, in Western Michigan, and each one of those cities is very, very different from the next. Um, and ultimately, you know, who controls the curbs in those, those uh, very independent and different cities is the city government. Mm -hmm. And our job at the Rapid, as we really work to transition into a coordinator of mobility, is to engage in that constant conversation and provide that constant input and, and seek out the input of, of the citizenry as well so we can deliver the message that uh, really uh, allows the, the city governments to make the choices that are gonna facilitate uh, the best uses of the curb and the roadways and, and all of those areas that are going to advance mobility. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I love the phrase, you're not the manager of transit, but of mobility. Mm -hmm. and I, so actually, which is a wonderful lead into the next question. I'm gonna combine two questions because they both deal with technology. And the question, I'll, I'll frame it, uh, as <clears throat> managers of mobility, not, not specific uh, modes at this point, but a, a rapidly changing mobility uh, 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 world, uh, what, how do you see technology affecting what you're doing, changing the things you do today, changing technology, changing what you do today, and then I'll ask you over the next 10 years what you anticipate in terms of the impacts of technology, different modes, mobility modes, et cetera, uh, and how you are planning for those. And you for your industry guidance and then the folks in the trenches. So I, I think, you know, technology today, it, it, it goes back to sort of my initial comments about kind of choices and mobility on demand. I think you're now able to access that. If I think about you know, where my office is, right? I'm at uh, 17th and I Street in downtown Washington, D.C., about a block from the White House. If I look out the window, mobility on demand is happening all the time. I mean, I can see a, a bike share, I can see scooter share, I can see traditional transit, I can see two metro stations, I can see package delivery, I can see it all happening at once, and I think technology is enabling a lot of what is happening, and the way it's happening today is because of technology, that we couldn't have the range of services that we have delivered in the way we have 
without technology. It's not fully mature. Mm -hmm. We're not at mobility as a service in the sort of the, the classic sense where it's all integrated and it's all available to you in one single app, one single payment. But I think we have the building blocks emerging to get to there and I can see that. So going forward, I think more of that will come together. You, you'll see it more seamless over time. But I also think that some of your opening comments, what we'll see is we'll see the TNCs become driverless in that urban area. Mm -hmm. And I think the question for my members and for a lot of cities is, are you gonna manage the way that happens or are you gonna let it happen to you? Wow. Well, hopefully you already have an answer, but yes. Well, yeah. I think we've, a lot of, uh, in yeah. the initial incarnation of this, a lot of yeah. it's happened to us, Yeah. right? All of a sudden there's scooters on the sidewalk where there weren't scooters yesterday. Yeah. Or there's bike share, bike lists, you know, in, in, a, in a way that, you know, yeah. we didn't anticipate. Oh, wow. yeah. And I think it's important when we think about how do we want those driverless vehicles to pick up and drop off that we consciously plan for them mm -hmm. and how, where are they going to fit in as mm -hmm. opposed to we let them happen and all of a sudden they're there and now we're reacting to it and trying to manage it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge today because it, it happens so fast. Yeah. It just, you know, it doesn't fit in this nice, neat planning. Yeah, no, I, you know. I, I, I grant that. One of the things that amazes me, the hotel industry had no idea <clears throat> two or three years before Uber and Lyft took off that they wouldn't need roughly a third of their parking spaces in three years. And you know, the you Look at an airport fast. today and how an yeah. airport has to yeah, yeah, manage right. its curb space today. It's probably the early frontier. Yeah. We all, many of us got here probably from the airport on Uber and Lyft, and they had to figure out where to put that yeah. on their curb space where that wasn't the issue five or 10 years ago. Oh, okay. They were building more parking. Thank you. Yeah. Jim. Well, um, as a planner, I get really excited about the data that comes in through the changes that have happened already. Um, and so I see the future for transit agencies being um, kind of data aggregators in a way. And I feel that APTA has done a good job um, having trans agents push themselves forward in um, getting some of this information. You know, we as trans agencies first had to uh, make our data available and open to everyone. Um, I feel that it was very strong, you know, so we can, they can use their apps, uh, or create apps and uh, help us ultimately. But um, what, I'm, what I see is that we need to be working with Ubers and Lyfts and the scooter folks to get the data from them. Mm -hmm. And then we as a trans agencies have an opportunity to kind of to be the, the place that everyone comes to to solve the mobility issue. And then we, once we have that information, we can, we can design routes, we can do all sorts of things um, with data we would never dreamed of having you know, even five years ago. Uh, we have origin, destination, time, how long it takes. I mean, there's a lot of information that we could now use. So for me, the future on that is um, you know, transit agencies getting the information and try, trying to do something with it. In terms of the future of transit agencies and how they're impacted, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's already, it's already been a big surprise um, with the scooters popping up and the shorter, shorter trips that happen as a result of that. But I think it's an opportunity to take the lead and, and make choices to impact it and not mm -hmm. sit on the sideline. Mm -hmm. so. Catherine. So I touched on the concept of the flexible street, not having a curb. So I definitely we are moving in that direction. What happens 10 years from today, no one really knows. To your point, we didn't know, uh, we didn't anticipate the, uh, the dockless scooters and the bikes that got thrown on our streets. Um, so the flexible street is, I think, the way we are moving forward as a city in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, things that we need to start working on in, in order to prepare for the coming future is uh, we need an inventory of our curb space. Most cities do not have that yet, ownership. Who uses it for what? Is it for parking? Is it for whatever? We need that inventory. We need to start looking at pricing the curb uses as well. Um, and how will all these packages get delivered? That's, the, that's another uh, question, right? Uh, with Amazon and online shopping just taken over our, uh, the, the way we shop, number of vehicles on the street, delivery vehicles, is just increasing. So that needs to change, it will change. So how, does, how do those things, those activities take place and how do we uh, carve out spaces within our street for that? Um, 
garages you mentioned we mentioned we talked about how we are moving away from car ownership and parking so how will these garages be retrofitted in the city of Fort Lauderdale we have uh, in our downtown one of our garages being retrofitted as a bowling alley by a private developer mm. so those things are going to start changing and um, how do we connect all these different technologies um, right now, we have dockless mobility. Uh, we have these free shuttles that came up in, our, in uh, Fort Lauderdale three months ago. Where you literally take an app. You, it's like an Uber, but it's free, just within our downtown circulator. So how do we connect all these uh, ways we move people uh, so we can use that information to maybe dynamic, uh, do dynamic pricing for our curb and also to facilitate the ease of use for our uh, people? Thank you. Grand Rapids. So we, uh, in, in becoming a coordinator of mobility, we're looking at what, uh, what within the new technology and all the disruption will really allow people to become more comfortable with the idea of a shared ride. Mm -hmm. uh, public transportation, buses, the trains, they are always going to be the backbone of any mobility model. Uh, but we want to find out how we can create a more holistic uh, uh, mobility model. And we're not running around thinking, okay, hey, Scooter showed up or this showed up. Yeah, how, hmm. how, do we, uh, how do we adapt to that or, or worse yet, how do we compete with it? It's more, how do we integrate that mm -hmm. and you know, get to a situation where you know, it, it's more of a plug and play. Um, you know, we, we saw docked bikes and now we're seeing dockless bikes and you know, all of this, uh, this change. So we wanna be able to create this model where as new things come up, we put it in, as they go away, we just put something else in there. And, um, you know, we, we look at other things like autonomous vehicles and whatnot, not from the standpoint of, okay, how soon till we get to level five and the buses are going by themselves? It's more, what kind of technology is coming out of the pilots that we're doing that's going to improve safety on the streets, improve, improve the safety of all the vehicles around our buses and on our buses to, uh, to create a, a better environment for everyone? <clears throat> I have a, a quick question that occurred to me as I was listening to all of you. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a kind of a tough issue, I know, uh, is um, that as autonomous mobility comes to uh, transit, uh, to buses, to other forms of transit, there are some drivers who won't have jobs anymore. Um, many may retire out, but it's, this will be a, a, a tough change. I however want to acknowledge that, but come to another side of this. Uh, one of the things that folks often point out to me is that uh, when you remove the cost of a driver, you can cut the operations cost by 30, 40, 50, 60%, depending on the mode, which could allow much more <clears throat> rapid, uh, frequent service, uh, and, and therefore an increase in convenience and, and use but also more demand for the curb. Is this something either your members or you as a consultant or you as folks in the trenches are thinking about? You know, I, I don't know that we've thought a lot about the impact um, on the sort of the driver and the workforce and those kinds of things. I was more we thinking of there. actually a little less, this is putting morals aside, the much shorter headways, oh. more convenience, and therefore hopefully more demand. Well, I. I go back to, you know, again, where I started. I think, right, that, that's what travelers want in mm -hmm. terms of mobility. That's what they've always wanted. We haven't had the ability to give it to them necessarily because of the various constraints, whether it mm -hmm. be labor constraints or um, equipment constraints or, or other things. So I, I think that the ability to give them more frequent service is a very much an attractive mm -hmm. to use that service. Mm -hmm. I also think there's some generational things in there too, in, in terms of the shared ride side. Mm -hmm. um, I know my son who lives in San Francisco, works in the tech industry. You know, he's, he uses Uber and Lyft, but he's always using Lyft line and Uber pool. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, why wouldn't I share a ride with someone when I can do it at half the price? Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of second nature to him mm -hmm. uh, where probably isn't to me. Uh, that's not where I start in thinking about using those services. And it's same with transit, I think. Yeah. He, he's very much about mobility. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to take the most convenient, 
available mobility at the least price, and it mm -hmm. can be traditional transit, or it could be mm -hmm. Uber and Lyft, or it could be, mm -hmm. you know, riding his bike. It mm -hmm. sort of depends on the moment. And so I think the the better the service is, if mm -hmm. that if there's, then I think it's going to be an attractiveness, particularly to the to an, a younger generation who's kind of grown up around mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. in a way that perhaps you know, I haven't. No, I understand. That formula you articulated is pretty compelling. Less expensive, more convenient, and serving your needs. Right. But how yeah. would you think about this? I, I don't think we've figured it out yet, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure, going into the future, if the larger size buses are going to be as necessary uh, along the main corridors. I agree with Jared 100%. It's highly efficient. It's the way to do it. It's the way to move the most people. But once we achieve a, a threshold where vehicles can drive themselves into communities, I, I think there's an opportunity for smaller 10-passenger 10, 10 vehicles or even eight kind of doing circulations and then hopping onto the main line because the, the transfer, you know, you're not going to need that anymore. It would slow mm -hmm. you down. So I really think that as an industry, we're, we're going to be struggling and figuring out you know, what's the right size vehicle. We might be branching into, into vehicles that are... Um, you know, it's much smaller than we might normally consider. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's really important that the industry, kind of tying into your equity question just a little bit, is, is stay focused on um, the equity of it and mm -hmm. the cost. Because the private industry, the, the, not everybody can afford an Uber and a Lyft even at half price. Mm -hmm. And that is really the role of the trans agency mm -hmm. is to provide that mobility at a, a, at a price that people can afford. So. Okay. And just to one of the points that I think if you look at, you, you like data, if you look at data, the jobs people want are moving into the core. The people who most need those jobs are being pushed out of the core. Therefore, you people are, are front and center to solving that problem. And I right. think you just address it. Right. Catherine. I just say ditto to what Jim said. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, and just add to your, your uh, Thing, um, your note on equity, I think having these con the conversations with our people, the people we build these infrastructure for is very important. And most often than not, when we do public meetings, which is typically a traditional way to get voices uh, heard, does not reach, we do not reach the people that really end up using the infrastructure. So as we talk about technology, we should also think about how better we reach out to the citizens, to the uh, people that need uh, the infrastructure more. We, uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale is looking at uh, doing surveys, so any projects, we send surveys out, um, and hopefully it reaches more people, but we do get a lot more feedback than um, we, than people who make it to these public mm -hmm. meetings. So having that voice as we design our infrastructure for the future. Thank you. Is, is your agency looking at the impact of driverless transit in maybe 10 years? And We are. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it's exciting. Uh, not, and, and we're not worried about the idea of, oh, if we can uh, go to AV, then a lot of people will be out of work, because mm -hmm. I really look at it more as it's an opportunity to retrain and further enhance the customer Perfect. experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the hardest jobs that a, a bus operator has is taking care of all those customers and trying to keep from driving off the road, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you're constantly being asked questions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I fully agree that we'll, we'll see situations where, in some cases, we're going to be driving very large vehicles and others, maybe they'll be smaller, but you still need to have that, that human element. And I think that it, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to uh, further increase usage of shared ride through that enhancement of the customer experience because we redeploy those employees to take care of our customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to switch gears here uh, rather fundamentally. Uh, one of the questions I've been asked to ask you about is, uh, what is a 21st century bus stop? Uh, and if you're folks like me, you're told, well, it's great to have swings, but I'm sure it's a lot more than that. Uh, can you talk about, uh, in terms of places that, that uh, really encourage transit use, that serve a broader range of transit users, Thinking forward over the next 10 years, uh, <clears throat> if, if mobility in cities will shift from owned to on demand, and, and that should create a much greater role for all of you and for, for transit, is the bus stop something that needs to change? Can that become a, 
Is there a 21st century version of a bus stop that's really cool that all of us want to go and hang out at? I'll let my, my transit friends uh, take okay. that one. Okay, and you can say no, no. Okay, well, I would, I go ahead. Oh. Well, I would say that the idea of a traditional yeah. bus stop might not be in there anymore 10 years from now. It, it, it's just as we access Uber and Lyft, it's anywhere that we need that facility, mm -hmm. that mobility option. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Um, I, as I stated earlier, uh, you know, buses and trains are still going to be the backbone of, yeah. of any mobility model. Um, and as much technology is coming through, uh, technology is not going to affect the weather. So uh, we still have to provide um, places where, where people can, can wait for their, uh, their mode to uh, show up. And it, it was interesting, I was in a meeting yesterday where they talked about you know, preserving dignity at the bus stop. If you're standing there in the pouring rain and you're mm -hmm. just waiting and other cars are splashing you and things like that, you know, it's not a positive customer experience. So we still need to create spaces that are inviting and, and that are accessible and work uh, for, for all modes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Does anybody have any questions that I have not actually been, I can't see you all because there are bright lights shining, but if anybody has a question, please go to a mic and we'll, we'll have a few more questions up here, but let's pause for a second. I, I have I a question, uh, Dave Carroll, I'm actually with APTA, but yeah. um, I wonder if we're perhaps being a little, as transit advocates, a little too passive. Uh, we as public citizens have invested enormously in our public transportation systems. We have not invested in Uber and Lyft and yet they are filling up the streets uh, and making it more and more difficult to deliver good transit. Uh, Andrew Johnson has said a few times that we're the backbone of the, uh, of the transportation network. How do we preserve that and how do we proactively preserve that? Do we have a right to proactively um, advance public transportation even if it might mean limiting some of these other forms of transportation? Huh, so we've heard a note of collaboration up here, uh, but that's a really terrific question. Well, let me, I'm gonna make it more pointed. Are, do you feel there is a conflict at this point between um, mobility on demand, Uber and Lyft, and what you need to do? Are they getting each other's way? Or are there op opportunities for collaboration? And to get back to your first word, is there a greater advocacy role that you need to place to shape how those services fit into the larger mobility world that you manage? And I, I, I guess I, I don't think you can go backward. Mm -hmm. You know, the horse is out of the barn. We are where we are and we're going forward. And so sort of wishing it was the way it was, I don't think is a plan for the future. I, I, I do think you have to think about, I agree very much that that the traditional transit is essential to move large volumes of people, and there's not another way to do that efficiently. Mm -hmm. But it has some limitations, right? It, it has some limitations of that first mile, last mile. It has some limitations of, of time of day. It has some limitations. And if you can collaborate, I believe, and create mobility as opposed to just transit service, then I, I think that's the solution we have to go toward, which means mm -hmm. you. You're gonna to have to coexist with these other mm -hmm. entities. And it, as I watch the sort of the transit community, it seems to me that the, the most forward thinking ones are the ones that are trying to find that right partnership mm -hmm. that takes advantage of the strengths of the traditional transit, but also tries to overcome some of those limitations. Thank you. And to your fellow panelists, are there specific ways that you see transit authorities agencies are succeeding in building that collaboration, that partnership? Or make another point if you'd like to, Jim. Well, I, I, I don't have any examples off the top of my head of other transit agencies, but I would agree that that's a really fantastic question um, in that the Uber and Lyfts of the world are <clears throat> you know, using a resource, being the roads that we have you know, used in the past, um, but they don't really pay any um, fee to use them. Right, they're not even buying gas. Uh, I mean, their employees are, but um, I mean, they are impacting the infrastructure that we utilize, and I think it's public space, and that as a transit agency, we should be advocating to get the information that they're getting 
um, from their passengers for origins and destinations. I don't see us being able to stop them. I think that we should be collaborating with them 100%. Uh, and because who knows how much longer they'll be around. I mean. You know, things come and go. I think they will be here for a while, but yeah. um, you just don't know. So I think it's an opportunity for trans agents to kind of go to the city agencies and say it's a public street. We need that information that can help us improve the mobility for everybody, uh, pedestrians included. And um, so that, that would be the role that I think trans agents to take. Catherine. Just a comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, I agree with you that I don't think the TNC should get a free ride out of this. I, I think they should have to provide data, or as some jurisdictions are doing, they should have to pay a fee because they are using the public right of way, they're right. using that curb. Uh, so I wasn't suggesting that they get it, maybe part of the partnership for free, just that you're gonna have to work with them because I think they're here to stay mm -hmm. in some, some form. Agreed, 100%, and I wasn't suggesting yeah. that either. <laughs> yeah. Captain. I'm good. Um, the, the Ubers and Lyfts, uh, I, I think um, it, it's been incredible how they've you know, created new ideas and they've uh, opened people up to new ways of thinking. Um, but I think most everyone will probably agree that uh, Uber and Lyft and anything like that, its business model is not long-term sustainable. Uh, they're going to have to find economies of scale. So it's not, it's not like Uber and Lyft's going to go away, but they're going to adapt and they're going to change. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm really excited to see how they do that and how we can integrate and learn from that as well. Um, if, if you know, they're, they're half as good as they say they are in recent IPOs and things like that, they are going to figure out a way to, uh, to not have one person, one car uh, on everything. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's see where that goes and uh, let's embrace it. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, my name is Sean Kennedy. I'm with uh, Ross Barazzini Macro. Ah. My question is, what are you guys doing currently to influence the policy of curbside management? That is, you know, you are a competitor for curbside for the transit properties. You're a competitor for the curbside, but you've been, um, you know, experiencing the the sort of uh, largesse of the community by having that curbside, right? Um, and so now, what are you doing to influence the policy with whomever is the policy maker or holder for the curbside? I'd like to hear that. And also, as a follow-on, any thoughts around enforcing? policy for curbside management. Thanks. I mean, I'll just mention, uh, as I think the question is probably better served with the other panelists, but I'll just mention that one of the things that IT um, has done is produced a practitioner's guide for um, curbside management. It's available on our website at ite.org, and I think it provides a, a, a great sort of introduction to the curbside and the kind of thinking that has to go on to figure out how to deal with the, both the policy side and the operational side. It's kind of a first step for us. We expect to do some additional work, but it really begins to, I think, frame up the conversation about all the demands and then how, from a planning and policy perspective, you bring together the various constituencies to sort of figure out the best way to allocate this precious you know, real estate among the various users. So I would just put that out there as a, a reference that's available for free from, from ITE. Thanks. Do you happen to address pricing? It talks about that pricing, and I think someone else, one of the other panelists mentioned that that, that is the frontier. That, yeah. And there are some examples. San Francisco, I think, is a great example of pricing parking and beginning through that, on-demand pricing of parking and beginning to think about pricing the curb. Um, so I think that's an early step in that direction. And do you have any thoughts about, we know how to charge for parking. We have a meter, or, or now we, maybe we can use an app, but it's the same. Basically, who manages charging for the curb? Well, that's, a good, that's a good question. And I, I, I think it would have to be the, um, you know, the, the public sector will have to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe through some public-private partnership or mm -hmm. some model like that, we'll have to do that, but again, I think if you look in that guide, there are, there's not an answer to your question, but I think there are some examples of cities who are beginning to look at, including Washington, D.C., that is beginning to price freight pick up and drop off, all the package delivery, mm -hmm. freight, uh, I think, you know, zones in mm -hmm. essence. So we have these little pieces out there in different cities. We don't have the, the full solution, but I think we, the leading cities are beginning to wrestle with the kinds of question you're asking. Thank you, that's terrific. 
Jim? Yeah. I'm not going to comment on this one. <laughs> so the idea of curb management is fairly new. I would say two, two years, three at the most. So the quick answer is we're still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, right way to do it. Uh, or there's no guidance on this is how you should do it. Uh, we are experimenting with pricing, uh, with getting the inventory of the curb space. We talked about uh, how we have a metered space and how rideshare sometimes uses that space. So in the city of Fort Lauderdale, when we did our pilot rideshare zones, there were 19 rideshare pick up and drop off in one zone, which is about six spaces. So when you think about it, there is definitely a way we can price these pickups and drop-offs. We broached on the topic of pricing with Uber and Lyft and did not go very well. So there, we will have to work on those topics in the coming, uh, in the near future. Uh, also, there's to add to your uh, resources, aside from the IT's practitioner's guide, there is a, another um, PDF from the, uh, FTA, the National Center for Mobility Management, and a peer exchange summary saying the rise of the curb, expanding mobility while protecting space, another resource to uh, look at. Um, yeah. Grand Rapids. As, as with anything, it really starts with relationship management. Uh, we're talking about managing the curb and what the strategies are. First, you have to have a seat at the table, and you have to have a credible voice. And mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're talking about not just pure business dollars and cents, we're talking about political uh, implications and, and that type of thing. And you need to look at the whole impact and really what you're trying to achieve. And if public transportation, if uh, you know the other interested parties, the neighborhoods, you name it, are not at that table talking about it, you're not going to have a plan that really works. Mm -hmm. So managing those relationships and getting it started that way is the most critical thing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Both that, this, the current question, the previous question, and your answers all point to the growing in <coughs> importance of <coughs> advocacy as a role for transit agencies as mobility changes and the opportunities you have really grow. Thank you. Uh, yes. A quick question. I'm Andrew Aiello. I'm from Tank, the Transit Authority, Northern Kentucky and suburban Cincinnati. Question about uh, the suburbs. You mentioned that a lot of our customers and a lot of low-income passengers are going to wind up finding themselves living in the suburbs. And then when we think about employment, we've seen the suburbanization of employment, warehousing, distribution, manufacturing. The curb space in both of those places is quite awful for a lot of our customers. Is there any discussion going on in your region and your jurisdictions about how to make the suburban curb better for our passengers? Who would like to start? I can go first. Sure. Um, Simple answer, there hasn't been enough discussion uh, yet. Uh, there, there has been in the Grand Rapids area um, a lot of gentrification uh, and displacement. Uh, you are seeing uh, affordable housing start shifting out to the suburbs and beyond the suburbs. And at the same time, you've got major employers that can't fill jobs because they can't get employees uh, who have reliable transportation. So you know, how do you provide that link? now? There is, you know, there are efforts to uh, to talk about how future development is going to go. Uh, again, that's a, a place where public transportation and others need a seat at the table to discuss uh, what what the needs are and and how really the land use uh, decisions need to be made. But um, I would say right now there's there's not enough thought going into that, and we are behind the curve, unfortunately. Catherine, Jim, anybody? No. No, I, I can go ahead. The only thing I would say is that um, in Nashville, we advocated for the transit agency to be at the table, um, which we don't have the time for, but um, to be represented at the table with developers. Because really, it's not so much the road space. Um, I mean, you're not going to put in miles of sidewalk you know, in areas that don't have people yet. And yet, it's a, it's a problem when a business locates and now they want 
a sidewalk or they won't service or whatever. So we have tried to get transit as part of the conversation at the planning and development stage so that if they are going to be looking for service and the transit agency can find out. Mm -hmm. It's also good to know in advance that they're going to they want a route or something crazy like that. Um, and then also that they consider that space when they design it. And so it may not exactly have, um, they might not, might not put a pad in for a shelter or whatever it is but uh, the space is there, and then when we have the resources and they have the demand and riders, then we can do it. Because mm -hmm. it's an uncomfortable space, I think, for transit agencies, the sidewalk. I mean, we don't, we don't have ownership, but our, our passenger's there. It's our most visible you know, part of our system besides mm -hmm. the buses, so it's, um, it's a challenge, and it's hard. Thank you. You, know, you mentioned advocacy and working with advocates, and I think that's an important element mm -hmm. for the public sector to figure out, because the advocacy community can be <coughs> your ally, we, we've been doing some work in the Vision Zero area in really trying to look at speed management relative to vulnerable users and sort of matching up kind of our traditional members with kind of the advocacy community for walking and biking and trying to get them to see that they're, they're not in opposition, mm -hmm. that, that most transportation engineers want to create a safe, walkable environment but they, you know, they, so they, they need to figure out how to work well with the advocates because the advocates are who can move the policymakers mm -hmm. in the same direction sometimes that the engineer wants the policymaker to go. And so if they can create this relationship between the advocates and the sort of the engineer and designer and the advocates understanding that the engineer or the planner is not their enemy either, mm -hmm. that, that's how they're going to get to what they're advocating for sometimes. It can be a, a, a powerful partnership, but you have to have some give and take and some listening between the two parties to see their common ground. And, mm -hmm. and we've been working that in the Vision Zero area, and it strikes me that I think some of those same principles apply in this yeah, conversation very, about very the curb space. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments? Any other questions from the audience? Again, I can't see you, so okay. thank you. Uh, it looks like we do. <clears throat> Right. Andrew started hitting the nail on the head for me a little bit about, I'm, I'm Peter Varga, about, about the issue Peter about- Peter Varga from- I'm also from Grand Rapids, but- Thank you, okay. Um, the, he hit the nail on the head for me about the whole issue about being the backbone of the system in urban areas. And so if you're thinking about streets as being backbones, and there's really not many last mile, first mile issues, there's high dense neighborhoods, people get to the transit system, so you're going to have to think about policies that says, where, where is the preferential mode in what corridor so that you start developing policies around that? So if you have a major corridor, you have a BRT line, or you have a, a, of a very frequent service in a high, highly dense corridor, um, what you have to start advocating for is that transit is the most important thing there. So where in other areas is something else more important that you should favor. And so there should be a complex policy in cities that says this is how we're going to address it. Otherwise, what you're doing is, 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 is you're listening to people who think this idea is great, that idea is great, but you're not really moving anywhere because you're not focusing on, on the ge geometry of the urban space that's, that specifies that transit and major corridors is more important. So I'd like to know what you think about that. In that that practitioner's guide, it talks a little bit to this issue and that you can't manage the curb piecemeal. You, you can't just manage it by looking at that one piece of real estate. You have to look at it in a more of a system perspective and understand where are the corridors where you're, you know, you're going to pro provide more focus on mobility as opposed to pick up and drop off. And, you know, and so I think that comment is right on the mark that you have, mm -hmm. to, you have to look at a larger scale to be able to make the right decisions at the micro scale. And if you're just focused on the micro, you sort of miss the system side of the equation. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, yeah. Peter, uh, Peter was my predecessor at the Rapids, so he absolutely knows what he's talking about. Um, and yeah, I couldn't agree more. It, it's got to be more about, yes, we're going to put the focus in terms of policy on providing 
mobility options uh, that, that focus on share, shared ride. Uh, it's, it's much greater than just saying, hey, you know, we're going to add 2,000 parking spaces. We still can't get the cars to those spaces because of the congestion. So we need to, in, in every policy, put that we're, we're going to focus on public transportation. We're going to account for public transportation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going <clears> to <throat> uh, just add a note on the, 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 the on related to suburbs, and this is, I, I'm, I'm a planner, not a, not a transportation guy, and so I am looking at this in terms of how do all the comments that you make and the terrific questions, that your, your terrific comments and your terrific questions relate to what's happening to cities and suburbs in our society as I see it from a planning perspective. And I talked earlier about the growing shortage of knowledge workers, which is very severe and driving lots of policy and lots of decisions. There's another shortage and issue that's not really driving, I'm sorry, no pun intended, uh, any policy as far as I can tell, but it's just as critical, uh, which is uh, the shift of poverty from cities to suburbs. Uh, because when poor folks are, and, and again, this is a population that's increased by more than 50% in, in less than two decades in our, in our 100 largest metros, and, is, and that pace is accelerating. When folks who, if you have an income of $25,000, $30,000 a year, the chance that you can afford the $11,000 a year cost to own and operate a car are pretty slim. You're, you are isolated. Uh, <clears throat> there is, I'm going to, well, there's a, obviously a, a many dimensions to this. You're isolated from, you, from education, from job training, uh, from health care, from each other. Um, you are particularly isolated from jobs. And at the same time, not only do we actually have a growing shortage of uh, knowledge workers, we also have a shortage, a growing shortage of low-skilled workers. Uh, at the same time, as uh, one, of, one of you noted, that low-skill jobs are relocating from cities out to suburbs where they're less accessible. Uh, and it's interesting, no matter how I look at this equation, whether it is at the knowledge industry end, driving our growth, driving policy, driving decisions, transit's increasingly important and the things you do increasingly important, <clears throat> or at the other end of the spectrum. And I, you're welcome to comment, but I more wanted just to make this point. And, and boy, when somebody mentioned advocacy, your role as advocates for helping folks see these problems. Suburban poverty is not visible. It's not a visible problem to many people. It's just a rapidly growing and really severe problem. But you're the ones who can see it and feel it and are at the front lines of, of dealing with it. So good luck, and I admire you for being there. But any comments? Or? I would just say I think the points that you make about understanding changing demographics are essential. Yeah. Uh, when you look at some of those trends, they're stark, and, and the impacts they will have on mobility and demand for services really change where we have been historically. And if you're not looking at those demographics, you, you can miss mm -hmm. what's coming at you. So I, I really yeah. think that was an important Thank framing you. issue. And any other question? I don't want to take up time if one of you has a question? Somebody looks like you're walking to a mic. Hi, my name is Charlotte Obazinski. I'm with Pace Bus in suburban Chicago. I'm an AICP and I'm a planner, um, but kind of fell into transportation. <laughs> so some of the things that I'm worried about as you talk about the suburbanization of poverty is cities' abilities to pay for infrastructure that supported cars for a long time, too. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of blanking on my question here. Um, I guess, what are we doing to talk to planners and interface with organizations like the American Planning Association to bring these um, issues regarding transportation to the forefront to our partners at land use planning uh, agencies. Well, I'll first say I, I've seen Richard Weaver at almost every planning conference I've been at, so your leadership is there. But I can take that. Um, so in the city of Fort Lauderdale, we <laughs> Uh, transportation division is kind of unique. We have planners and we have uh, engineers. We're working together to uh, build a better transportation system, right? So we have a master plan which prioritizes, based on land use, which corridors would be a transit priority, which corridors would be a bike priority, so we can put the necessary infrastructure in the right places. Not all streets can hold everything. It's just not physically possible in our urban space. So that's the overlap. Once we identify in a larger city scale our corridors that are prioritized for transit or bike or pedestrian movement, um, we can move forward and design it in a much more detailed way when we get into smaller projects. 
Thank you. With seconds to go, do any of you have final comments you'd like to make? Anything you'd have a chance to say? Okay. So I want to thank uh, our <coughs> panelists, uh, Andrew, Catherine, Jim, and Jeffrey, for really terrific comments. I, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, <coughs> one of the things that I really found fascinating uh, is, in addition to the ways I might see a city and, and, the, and the issues that we raise, <coughs> is your, each of you have talked about how many more forms of mobility there are and how many you see coming and the importance of your agencies as mobility managers not directed toward a specific mode. And that seems to me to be a huge role. I know from the folks I work with at cities, nobody else is doing that. Uh, and I, I certainly applaud that. Um, second, I found fascinating, Catherine, you noted this, all the things we want to do with our city spaces. We want to have festivals. We want to have parklets. We want to have water slides in New York City. And the best place to do that, is the, 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 the most of the land the city owns is actually in the form of streets and curbs. And, and this is a great way to bring vitality to an urban core and to those merchants that you're talking about. And to, <clears throat> that's a very positive way, in addition to the sort of technical, boy, we need more access to the curb, to think about all the exciting ways opportunities that we are seeing in terms of how we use our streets and, 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 our, and our, <clears throat> our parking lanes. And I can tell you, nobody else is managing that and unlocking those opportunities. So thank you. Uh, thank you all for your interest and your terrific questions. Uh, uh, you have a, a great set of panels ahead of you. And uh, thank you very much.